Welcome to the podcast. We do recover with Jared Miller, your host. And I'm Dr. Terry Sellers, your co-host. This is a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, about recovery. We want to talk about what successful recovery can look like. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. You're listening to episode 18 of We Do Recover. I'm your host, Jared Miller. Today, I'm joined in the studio by your co-host and our medical expert, Dr. Terry Sellers. What's happening, everybody? Good morning. We also have in the studio the man that makes this thing possible, our producer, Sean Denovan. Hi. Oh, he spoke into a mic. I thought you were supposed to just yell across the room. Hi, guys! There you go. That's, uh, that's, that's become his signature. That's kind of the signature. Yeah, I like it. We also have a, a featured guest for you today, the man that founded Reflections Recovery, Dave Cox. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good. Excited to be here. This podcast was recorded in sunny St. George, Utah. Episode 18, part one is brought to you by Steps Recovery Centers, where addiction ends and healing begins. If you or loved one needs help, please just reach out to them, 801-800-8142. Do some check-ins. Dr. Sellers, did you get the message I sent you this morning on Facebook? Holy war. Stunned silence. Holy war. Did you not oh, you holy see war. it? Yeah, listen. Holy war. That's a check-in. <laughs> I, I, I'll believe this thing when I see it, but... First of all, Utah hasn't stepped on the field yet, so it's a little premature to talk about the fact that we could actually play each other. Uh, you're, I think you're just nervous that we might I would love, two undefeated teams. I would love that game, but we might beat you, buddy. Well, no, there's listen, <laughs> I, listen. There's a lot of people out there talking about how this just doesn't have much appeal for BYU because they have almost nothing to gain by beating Utah, and everything to lose. And uh, first of all. Let's talk about football players. They don't think that way. Like every football player wants to step on the field with the other football players and try to beat the other guy. That's how they feel. So the fans thinking that, oh, we don't want to lose this. Uh, the, I tell you, BYU players for sure want to play Utah, and Utah players for sure want to play BYU. I hope That's it what happens. competition is, right? Oh, absolutely. So they, they, they want to play the game. I just don't know if I believe it'll happen. Should we put a wager on it? Sure. Whether so, it'll happen or a wager on the actual on game. The game. Oh yeah, like for I'm, sure. I'm trying to get my next semester yeah. tuition if you'll, paid. If for you'll it. go, if you'll go straight up without points, I'll take any amount of money you get. You want to bet? <laughs> so here will be the wager. <laughs> if Utah wins, wife's listening. Ten thousand dollars. You pay my next semester's tuition. Ooh. <laughs> if, if BYU, if BYU wins. I'll pay my next semester tuition. <laughs> this is going to end up being a gambling wow. recovery podcast. Yes, yes, soon. yes. Thank you for pointing Thank that out. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. We'll have a Gamblers Anonymous meeting right after this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Listen, Dave Cox. Oh, wait. Let me give you my good, new and good, though, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Check in. Check in. This. Sorry. Uh, my good friend, Dave Cox, is on our podcast today. And life has taken Dave and I... Um, uh, a little bit away from each other. We used to play golf every single Tuesday and see each other every st single week and just busyness and that sort of stuff. And we might get into some of Dave's um, surgical issues on the podcast, but we, we haven't played golf much in the last few years. And so just driving down with Dave was fun. That's my new and good. Like we've had a good time just hanging out and kind of, kind of figuring out where we are. Cause we, we, we haven't seen each other in, four to six months maybe yeah i mean it's crazy life and covid yeah so anyway that's my new and good i got to hang out with dave this weekend it was good dave what's new and good with you anything <laughs> happening yeah anything yeah actually uh, uh lots of have been happening you know staying busy but i've actually turned to possibly retiring what, what? speaking to your mic and uh, and stepping back a little bit, kind of hand the flame over to a, uh, one of my trusted colleagues and and uh, take some time to spend with my wife, my grandkids. And wow, you're scaring me. We are the exact same age, basically. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm not ready to retire yet, mostly because financially I couldn't do it if I tried. But whatever. So tell us that trusted colleague. What's his name? Uh, Dustin Barker. Dustin Barker. Dustin Barker might have a message for you this morning. Yeah. <laughs> we're, do, we're doing live hey, stuff this right is now. Hey, Dustin Barker. Um, just wanted to share my love for Dave. I met Dave in 2008 at a facility called the Ark of Little Cottonwood and have followed Dave around since. He's one of the most passionate, um, amazing people I've ever met, selfless, caring, and kind. 
um, an awesome example of recovery, and there's no way I'd be alive or um, here without him. Love you so much, Dave. Wow. That was a surprise. Yeah. yeah I like nice. it. Great surprise. And remind me to pay him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thanks for, uh, thanks wow. for leaving that message. Oh, Justin. but listen, that's, a, a, that's a strong message. Uh, Dave's not going to accept this, but that's a guy who, uh, and he's partially wrong, I get it, but who attributes his life to Dave saving it. And that's not, I mean, Dave won't say this, so I'm saying it, but, <laughs> um, but that that's why dave does this job i guarantee it like the, like there's people out there that need help and dave has been willing to step in and, and help them so we've been fortunate to to be able to guide you know set, guide tell them where not to step maybe and and uh you know these guys do the work they find their way they 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 make the changes in their lives and we just get the opportunity to give them some direction. And, and Dustin is one of those guys for 12 years, for several years, he struggled in and out and off and on. And, and, uh, man, it just, it came on really strong for him. He, he, uh, he became, uh, uh, you know, a good, honest, sober recovery guy. He started working in the industry and now he's very well known as, as one of the best marketers for, recovery that's awesome i gotta say if i can take a minute do a quick little check-in a common theme that i've noticed with people that have long-term recovery is a lot of times they have somebody that kind of looks out for them you know and, and i can't speak for everybody because everybody's you know journey in this thing is is different right but i know for me loss was a big thing lost my dad lost my brother and Honestly, I can't say that I, I would be sitting here in front of you today, clean, sober, and doing this thing if it wasn't for people like Terry. If it wasn't for, you know, amazing people, John Gossett, uh, Ty Hansen, the guy that sponsors this podcast, just people that are willing to make that connection, right, that camaraderie, and say, hey, you know, let me help you. Let me help you get to that next level. Let me show you the way. Yeah, you know what? That's the the uh, I think the magic of the recovery program or the the uh, recovery community. It's it's a, the twelfth step, you know, where people start helping one another. And and I had those same mentors. Uh, you know, I had people that that looked out after me and that that became uh, um, examples of what I should do and what I need to do. And and it, it, it's kind of a, a legacy. They help me. I get to help someone else they'll help someone else and it just kind of goes on and on yeah i also got to mention real quick i got to give some love to uh ty MP. I mean i recently i took a job as the intake um coordinator and, and marketing guide for crossover recovery and that was 100 percent because of a friend of mine ty MP. so it really is pretty cool how how you know that works i, I gotta i gotta interrupt how's your anxiety level right now jared uh it's Higher, medium, or low, you think? Probably medium. This is as free form as we've ever started this podcast. <laughs> like, we almost always kind of have a little format, and uh, we're uh, <laughs> ten minutes into this thing, and uh, we're just kind of free forming it so far, which is cool to me, because that's... That's that, what you love. That's, I, I, that's what, this is what I do, right? I... I my life is free form. Like I don't plan very well and <laughs> that sort of stuff. And so this is, this is interesting, but I'm sitting here thinking, I wonder if, cause it feels like we haven't quite started the podcast yet, right. except we're 10 minutes into it. My, right? my OCD is starting. Yeah. To, yeah. I'm yeah, starting this, to get a little, this is kind of cool. We normally, uh, we normally start Dave with just kind of a quick, Hey, who's Dave Cox? And we haven't even gotten there yet. So I love this. This is, this is beautiful. And this is, to me, what the podcast is designed to do is kind of a, yeah, we have an agenda. There's no question about it. We have a, we have a format. We have things that we like to do on the podcast. There's but be a some conversation thing. among friends is what this is supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. And there's got to be some structure to it. Sure. You're right. Maybe I do get a little rigid at times. No, no, I don't. It's fine. <laughs> like, like the rigidity is... Um, uh, it's good in some ways and it's bad in some ways. The free form is good in some ways and it's bad in some ways. Maybe that's a, a metaphor for recovery too, because moderation kind of in all things and, and the thing about addiction really is 
our brains weren't built to handle the amount of, and I, I harp on this every podcast, but our brains weren't built to handle the amount of dopamine that drugs and alcohol give us, yeah. but our brains were built to handle dopamine. Without dopamine, nobody has any fun in life. And the art of recovery to me is that art of sort of moderation of getting dopamine, but not so much that it feels like you're on crystal meth. <laughs> right? And so, right, right. So some free form and some structure is great. Yeah. All free form isn't great. All structure isn't great. If you're all structure, your girlfriend's not going to love that because spontaneity is great in relationships. I'm not specifically talking to you. I know Mandy. <laughs> she's awesome. But also, if you're all free form, like your girlfriend's not going to like that either because they need some structure. I, I, right. I don't know much about relationships. I don't know why I brought that up. But <laughs> You've only been married, what, 30? 38 years. Only 38. That's all due to the greatness of my wife. I promise you that. But Because she is a lot more structured, and that's what makes a great relationship. Right. I love you, sellers. With that said, let's get into it. Yeah, you let's do that. Let's actually pretend like we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm here. Get it. We kind of have a format sometimes when I'm out of the studio and, and Skype in, uh, Jared leads a discussion. And if I'm here, he wants me to do it sometimes just so I can feel like I'm part of the podcast. But uh, Dave Cox, who are you? So the real question is right now, just right now. Tell me about like Dave Cox, what, what you do, what you're doing. Uh, love to hear about, you know, your, I don't know if you have a wife or not. I'm kidding. I know his wife pretty well. <laughs> um, tell us about your wife, her name. If you want to, you don't have to do names, kids, that sort of stuff. Dave Cox, not, not, not professional Dave Cox, but just Dave Cox. Well, Dave, I'm Dave. I'm a Hi, Sagittarius. Dave. I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> this is not Tinder or, listen, I'm old. I don't know what, even what dating websites are anymore. Is Tinder a dating website? Yeah, it okay, definitely thanks. is. Well, you know, I'm just a, a, a guy that's had quite a, uh, we were joking earlier, the, the investment and the time spent in research to become a, a an addictions counselor. And so... You know, I'm a guy that just went through a lot of different stuff and, and had a lot of ups and downs. And, and uh, I found that, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, examples and people that were making a difference. I just found that, uh, man, I, I want to do that. And so in the midst of stuff, I was able to go back to school at a very late age and, and uh, uh, get involved in, in recovery. And, and uh, amazingly, magically, doors started opening to where I was able to, to, you know, be a co-founder and own a facility. I love that. If you don't mind me asking, how did that transition happen? Like, how do you, so can you kind of paint that picture for us? You've said that you want to make a difference. That's what yeah. got you into the industry. How did that transition happen for you? Okay. Wait, I think we, I got to stop this. No. Yeah. Okay. We're way off our normal format. Okay. Oh, wow. Now, now he's we? getting... The roles have reversed. Yeah. Yes. Well, we can do it, though, I guess, because we used to do it this way, right? We used to... Remember, we used to do the... In the first part of this podcast, we used to do what you're doing now and then go back. But um, we can do that, I guess. I don't know why I'm uptight about it. Let, let me... Answer it. Let me, uh, let me just... just fill in right here because I do have, I have three lovely daughters. There you go. That's what I want to know. Um, you know, do you want to do names or not really? Uh, Kelsey, Candace, Taylor. I've, I was um, thinking maybe you couldn't remember their names. So <laughs> I didn't want to embarrass you. <laughs> okay. uh, I've got a, a son-in-law named Jamie. That's uh, you know, that's awesome. They're, they're all in, in recovery at this point. And uh, you know, they, they watch me go through the the hard times and the bad times. I've got a beautiful wife that is is just absolutely amazing in my life. Yes, you do. Talk about relationships. I'm I'm the guy that's that's been married four times, and so divorce three. And I couldn't do relationships, and it wasn't until I I got in recovery and started doing things differently that that things were able to work. And of course, she's very kind and patient, and and uh, you know puts up with me. She is. So, so that's my life. I, I, uh, um, can, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Uh, what's your wife's name? Michelle. Okay. Uh, anything new in Michelle's life today? Today? Uh, today she's getting a new car. Oh, yeah. Getting a Jeep. She's getting a new Jeep. Yep. So good Love for that. her. 
Love that. Relationships. <laughs> good things happen. This is the this is the podcast to me. Yeah. Good yeah. things happen when people find sobriety and continue on that path. Yeah. You know what else I love that he shared? He was vulnerable and said, been married four times. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guess what? You fall down three, get up four, right? Yep. That's, That's Dave, cool. Dave got up four for sure. And and his, his and wife's amazing. She is it, it's it's been it's bliss. I mean it is really amazing. We have a very, very good life. And I and I owe that I think to to just recovery. Yeah. You know, so many things change when you get into recovery and 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 so that going back to your question, that's kind of what happened is um I had been to treatment several times and didn't take it real serious. I, I didn't change what I was doing much. Uh, and when I finally got desperate enough to, to really do the deal, I, I mean, it was either that or, or die. And, and, um, and in fact, suicide was, a, was an option and, and an, an attempt. And, and, and so when, when, I, when I went in with that level of des- desperation, things changed. Um, I fell in love with recovery. I fell in love with, uh, you know, who I was becoming and what was happening in my life. And I, I decided at that point, this is what I want to do. It was such a profound life changing experience. I decided that hell, I was 45 years old and, and decided that I'm going to go back to school and, and change a profession. And, and and start messing around with this stuff and and so that's kind of how it started that um i want to i want to go back to that do you remember the moment of desperation like what um what was that do you question was there an event or a feeling or anything that you would call that moment of desperation like people call it rock bottom, the rock maybe. the rock yeah. bottom yeah. moment it was def- yeah definitely rock bottom and and my theory on rock bottom by the way is is if you think you've hit rock rock bottom go out and use again it's a whole new level <laughs> yeah. i've experienced that with like i said several treatment attempts and relapses and that Great kind of point. stuff Great point. but for me that that when i stopped digging was when um I, I had just had enough. It was affecting my um, my relationship with my kids, um, um, my ability to work and hold a job. Uh, I, I felt miserable and horrible about myself. And, and like I said, I, I, I got to the point where I thought, you know what? I think I could disappear and make things better for my family and everybody mm. involved. And that's, that's just horrible thinking, you know, cause uh, I, I look back at that time, my, my brother actually videotaped this, the ambulances and all this kind of stuff that, uh, that came. And, and I look back at that and I think, I rarely have a bad day now. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't believe how desperate and dark that my life was. And it was all because I was using drugs. I had, I was financially embarrassed, uh, spiritually bankrupt. Um, you know, and this has been going on a long time. I, I, my addiction started when I was very, very young. Um, Doc, you'll, you'll understand this. Back in the day, in my day. Yeah, we're old, by the way. Yeah. We're the exact same age, <laughs> Dave and I. It was okay to put a little paragoric in your baby's bottle. Oh, for sure. To settle, settle the stomach. And, and, and so, man, I was getting high as a baby. Now, hold on. What's paragoric for Paragor- millennials like me? That have no clue <laughs> yeah, what you're talking exactly, about. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, you say that to me, and I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Happened all the time. Yeah. Like, your mom was not the only mom putting paragoric <laughs> in bottles. Everybody's mom was doing it. Not everybody's, but paragoric is a... A derivative of an opiate. I mean, it's basically an opiate. It's mild, but it's a, it's definitely derived from opium. Huh. And you could buy it over the counter. Wow. I mean, it was unbelievable. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, so I, I learned at an early age that something, a substance, yeah. could make a difference, could m- change the way I feel. And, uh, you know, like a lot of kids, I, I, I didn't, uh, I had low self-esteem and I wasn't a jock, um, and I wasn't, uh, smart. <laughs> and so I was looking for, you know, 
people to hang with. And unfortunately, the, the, you know, you, you start going with the wrong crowd because they're, they're very accepting. Uh, we all are, you know, that's, uh, um, and, and that's where I kind of landed and, and, um, and using substances to feel a little bit better was, was part of my, it was part of the deal. Well, and it's easy, you know, to be accepted by the party crowd when your family owns the drive-in <laughs> in Springville, right? I mean, that's like, that's like the party platform out there, or it sounds like it was in your day, right? Yeah. Yeah. My family had a, a drive-in theater. And, and so I worked out there from the time I was in junior high, uh, you know, all the way, all the way through. And so I'd be out there and guys would sneak in and, you know, would sit on the back row and smoke pot and drink and, um, and carry on. It, it was late nights the, before I'd get home. When you say guys would sneak in, what you mean is, oh, wait, this is probably before cell phones, so I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> you mean somehow they'd show up at the drive-in, contact you, and you'd get them in? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> so, uh, there was many nights that, uh, you know, we, <laughs> mom, relax on this no, one, but many <laughs> nights that after, you know, after the, the, the crowd had gone and the theater was ready to close, man, we'd fire up the movie again and, and, uh, and watch a movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, Substance that's induced. Yeah. Yeah. Well, How Alice, cool is that? Alice Cooper had a movie out. Uh, was it school's out for summer? Or, yeah. Yeah. School's out. And, and, and so we, uh, yeah, we'd have like a kegger there at huh. wee hours in the morning. So. You listen, how cool is he? <laughs> like, hey, listen, when I was a kid and I wanted to invite friends over for to watch a movie, I didn't have like a drive in theater to show the movie on. Right? Like, how cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> no wonder you found some popularity. Like, hey, let's go to Dave's. You should see his big screen TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's 80 feet large. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Well, you know, and that one thing leads to another when you, when you, when you start getting recognition and people like you for all the wrong reasons. Um, things like providing, like having the guy with the dope. Yeah. Uh, it becomes a, you know, you, it, it's, it's more about the being recognized and, and being sought after. And, and, uh, you know, when you're the dope man, you're popular. It's a sense of identity in a way. Yeah. 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 And so that became a, a way of life for a while, I, uh, you know, just selling drugs. And, and uh, in fact, one of the one of my dear friends that, that we worked with, he ended up going to prison for a long time. And, and for some reason, I was able to to uh, never get busted for that stuff. I, I, and I don't know how because I wasn't I wasn't real careful. I was kind of stupid with it. And. Uh, and well, luckily we kind of, we kind of moved out of that phase and, and as most addictions do, I started to, to be a recluse. I started to, to yeah. kind of fade back a little bit. Right. And that I can totally relate with that because I tell people all the time, one thing that I never really had to change was my social circles because I didn't use with other people. I was a closet addict. Yeah. I was ashamed of it. I knew what I was doing was wrong. Right. Right. I mean, it was, it the shower before as i got home from work in the shower i would yeah i don't want to glorify your war story but yeah i mean so i understand yeah that, that's kind of i think that's the direction most people with actual addiction go right yeah nobody starts that way your first almost no one's first use is in a closet no, right i mean right. have you ever heard somebody say well i started using in the closet no, they start at the places, right? So i started with migraine headaches people start at high school parties people start with an injury people but the people that wind up getting addicted or dependent on that substance all wind up using to the point where they don't really want their friends to know how much they're using. Right. So yeah. it all ends up in, in some secret place. <laughs> well, dark, it, cold, secret place. And, and then your friends say, listen, let's get going before Dave uses anymore because he turns into a chocolate mess. That was said regularly. <laughs> so. A ginger mess for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we're about out of time. Uh, we've been we've been talking with Dave Cox, the uh, co-owner of Reflections Recovery. We'll be back right after the break. If you guys like this? Please comment, share. It's available on all major podcast platforms.
You are listening to We Do Recover with Jared Miller and co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. We'll be right back after this short break with more of We Do Recover with Jared Miller, sponsored by Steps Recovery Center and the Hilton Garden Inn. I'm Desmond Lomax, one of the clinical executives here at Steps Recovery, and once you become of the Steps family, you're just a part of the Steps family. A lot of us have overcome substances, overcome addiction, and now we're able to help other people. Second of all, we're also going to help you in a way where you can afford to be helped. Third of all, we're going to give you the same quality that many organizations are charging two to three times, and it's more about you than it is about our organization. We welcome you back to We Do Recover with Jared Miller, co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. And now with part two of our podcast, Jared Miller and Dr. Terry Sellers. Welcome back to episode 18 of We Do Recover. We have a featured guest here, Dave Cox. We're getting his story of his life. Um, Episode 18, part two is brought to you by St. George Hilton Hilton, the Man. Hilton Garden Inn. Episode 18, part two is brought to you by Hilton Garden Inn, St. George. It's oh, always good. sunny and bright at the Hilton Garden Inn, St. George. If you're traveling through Southern Utah, go ahead and give them a Google search. Just type in Hilton Garden Inn, St. George. You're not going to regret it. Amazing amenities. Yeah, Dave and I stayed there last night. Yep. Beautiful. We each had beautiful rooms. It was, I love that place. They're I meant good. to They're shoot. They're good to us. Yeah, I meant to shoot like a little pre, you know, announcement of today's. Yeah. And uh, it went terrible. Because first of all, <laughs> So I, I showed the place, right? And but I knew what rooms you were staying in and I walked clear to the end of the hallway before <laughs> realizing I'd passed your guys' room. And then as I'm listening to it to make sure the quality's okay, I didn't realize I had a body mic on and so I can't like can't hear anything you guys are saying. No. Well, we were having fun. It's amazing. Dave it has been nice place. D- by the time you came up to our rooms, Dave had been awake for six hours <laughs> and I'd been awake for six minutes. So there you go. One of these times we're gonna, I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna catch sellers in the shower. No, you're you know? right. <laughs> I'm gonna no, get a room key. And t- t- no, you remember those little locks that they, oh, you can sl- the, like the little latches you slide over. Mine slid, so you can't get in my room no matter how. <laughs> Although you can open it about four inches and stick your camera inside. Yeah, that's what's gonna happen. See what next happens. Time. All right. Well, we got a we got a caller. Should we get this? Yeah. Sure. All Let's right. Do that. Hi, yes. My name is Corey. I'm from St. George. This question is for Dr. Sellers. Um, I was kind of wondering your opinion and pros and cons on the new Supplicate shot and uh, your feelings about it. So, first of all, Corey, Corey's a buddy of mine. i got to give him a shout-out. I, He's a good dude. Thank you for calling that in, Corey. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll give him a second shout-out. Uh, I, I know Corey's been a big fan of the podcast. Corey's been great and supportive, right? I, He's I on like our volleyball that. team. Well, no, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Like I, I, so I showed up uh, a couple of weeks ago to uh, to play volleyball. There's a sober volleyball league down here in St. George, and I, I played some volleyball growing up. My brother uh, played a lot of volleyball growing up. Played actually played for BYU for a year. And then won a national club title with UVU. My brother's a volleyball player for sure. Shout out to Jared Sellers. Jared Sellers. He's my a, best yeah, friend. He's a good guy. Um, but anyway, I, I like volleyball. I, I'm 61. I don't play very much anymore, obviously, and my skills have. Anyway, I showed up to volleyball. I knew Corey had been a fan of the podcast, but I had never met him. So I show up, and there's this dude with a, he, first of all, he had a mohawk. <laughs> he was wearing his mohawk, and it was spiked, and it was, uh, you know, way too cool for me. I, I couldn't pull something like that off, but it was cool. But I'm I looking at the guy, like, I'm 61. Let's be honest, I'm a little judgmental. So like, <laughs> Who's this weirdo with the mohawk? Like, And then we start playing volleyball, and... First of all, the guy's got a motor like nobody's motor, oh, like yeah. a million miles an hour. A mil- he's all over the place. He's Hustler. diving. He's jumping. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's got sand everywhere. I mean, it was we had a ton of fun, and that's Corey. Corey's been a big fan of the podcast, but a super good guy. I loved meeting him. He's a great guy. So once you get thanks to know for the him, question. once you get to know him, you realize he can rock it, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, just, yeah. just his personality. It's, that's Corey, yeah. right? That's exactly Corey. It's a great personality. I love it. So thanks for the question. Let's get to Sublicade for a second before we waste uh, – uh, too much time talking about other stuff. No, I, 
talking about Corey's not a waste. I didn't mean to say that, but <laughs> we do have some things we got to get to. So I'll, I'll be sort of brief on Sublocade. But for those of you that are not aware, Sublocade is now an injectable form of buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is the, the active, basically the active ingredient in both Suboxone and Subutex. Buprenorphine is, and I think we've gone over this in a previous podcast, but buprenorphine is a partial opiate agonist. Those are medical terms that you don't have to understand, but basically I'll break that down. It means it goes into your brain, binds to the same opiate receptors that all other opiates, painkillers, do, but it only turns them on part of the way. It's a little harder to get high on a partial, it's much harder to get high on a partial opiate agonist than it is a full opiate agonist. Full opiate agonists are all the things that you know that are painkillers. Methadone, including methadone, heroin, Lortabs, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, all that stuff are full opiate agonists. Buprenorphine's a partial. Now, uh, the, uh, the one thing I, I love about Sublocate is you get a once a month injection. So it does a, that does a couple of things for you. First of all, it takes pills out of people's hands. There is always a behavioral component of uh, drug use and addiction. And part of that behavioral component is putting something in your mouth or shooting it into your arms or how, you know, smoking it, whatever. Every time you feel something that you don't like. Yeah. And Sublocade will take that away because you get a once a month shot. And now when you, when you're not feeling great, you don't put something in your mouth at that time, or you don't shoot it into your arm or smoke it. So it takes that behavioral component away, which I love. It's an overall slightly somewhat lower monthly dose of buprenorphine than if you're using the Subutex or Suboxone tablets or films. So you get less exposure to the buprenorphine. Uh, and then the other component it takes away for the physician is, and this is the point I wanted to make when I heard this question was, so I, I was an obstetrician for a long time. I cannot tell you how many people called my office and said that their lore tabs or their Percocet accidentally <laughs> got flushed down the toilet of or course. their dog ate them or, you know, their neighbor stole them or now the neighbor stealing them thing is actually possible. But why, why is it that dogs never take hypo, their thyroid medications or their birth control pills? Why do high blood pressure medications <laughs> never get flushed down the toilet. It's only pain pills that get flushed or benzos that get flushed down the toilet, right? This takes that component away too, like early refills. No, you can't call and say, I lost my pills. It's, it's injected into you. You can't lose it. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of good things. I, I could go on for a while about what I like about Sublocade, but I do like it. I have to jump in with this yeah. pills comment. So I uh, was missing some of my pills the other day. Okay. Okay. I'm taking testosterone and Crestor. Okay. Big deal. So I called up saying, I, I'm, I think I lost them. I can't find them. And then I said, I feel really bad because how often do you get calls from people saying, I lost my Crestor? <laughs> and the lady just kind of laughed. I said, I'm, I, I, I'm not. I really think somebody took them, but <laughs> I don't know what's that worth on the open yeah. market. I have no idea. It's like a bunch of people like I need lower cholesterol. Yeah. <laughs> All the guys out on the under living under a bridge wanting to decrease their cholesterol. But having listened to you guys, I felt <laughs> nervous asking for more medication from my doctor for my my cholesterol. Yeah, <laughs> That's awesome. I had the same experience with my teeth. If you remember this, I. I had, uh, on this podcast, we played this out, but I had some implants put in my bottom teeth. And I told the guy ahead of time, I'm, a, I'm an opiate addict. And so I didn't want to do opiates. And it wound up hurting a lot more than I thought. But once I'd already told him I was an addict and I don't want to, um, I don't want opiates, then I got hurting and I'm like, oh man, I really need something. This is really bad. But I was too chicken to call the guy back up. So I suffered in silence for a well, lot, not silence. I whined to my wife the whole time, but I suffered for a long time. Okay. I spent way too much time. Sorry. That's okay. Let's transition yeah. it into, I yeah, mean, let's get back to Dave. I know that our guests can totally relate with pain and surgeries oh. and go ahead sellers. Let's yeah, Dave, let's do that. Let's do that. Dave and I used to play golf every Tuesday morning. It was a ritual for us. We haven't done that for a number of years now, and let's do that. Let's talk about Dave was playing golf. His knee was hurting. He wound up going in to get his knee scoped. I went in, he got it scoped. They they did the the uh, cortisone injections, and and it came around that I finally had to have knee surgery, and uh, they put a partial knee in, and um, you know, after a couple of weeks into it. Uh, 
there's a little plastic piece in there that popped out. Very painful. Emergency surgery to go in and place it, put it back in. Uh. They said, Dave, you need to relax, take it, take it easy. And so they put it all back together. Uh, another 10 days and first I, first surgery was a scope right no uh, no the, the i i'd had a scope on it okay but the first actual surgery was a, a partial knee replacement okay um the second one was was fixing that you know putting the, the piece back in and they thought i was just being too active on it uh it pops out again so the third surgery they go in and they say wow this is uh there's a problem here let's take a look at this they they go in and find a bone spur that was pushing the little plastic piece out so they fix it sew it all back up together and uh, i don't know what to do with the mic <laughs> so uh they they put it uh um put it all back together and uh, three weeks into it it happens again so now they decide for uh, surgery number four, they decide to put a full knee into it. Um, so they change that out, put a full knee into it, and then I get infected. Oh. They, uh, they open it up, they scrub it out, and, and it's, it's getting painful. The infection was very, very painful. And so they, they put it all back together, and the infection didn't go away. So then they have to pull out all the, the hardware. And... Um, that's a frequent thing in medicine. If yeah. if you have like an artificial piece, like a piece of plastic or metal inside of you that gets infected, a lot of times that metal has to be removed or the infection won't go away. So that's that's yeah. common. Two months, um, IV antibiotic, that kind of thing. Um, then they then they go in and, and fix it, and then I just feel a little froggy and think, wow, I can finally walk. Went out, slipped on some wet grass, and, and <laughs> busted it wide open. And uh, so we had eight surgeries in eight months. Does anybody else feel like they need a painkiller just oh. listening to all that? <laughs> this, yeah. is the, like, this is the same <laughs> knee. Can you eight, imagine having a surgery a month? I got to I gotta emphasize eight surgeries in eight months. In eight months. Can now, you if, even wrap your head around No, that? listen, if you guys can think about this, so a knee scope, they make a couple of little incisions and put a scope in there, right? Well, that's not what's happening today. First of all, when he gets the total knee replacement, like the, sur the scar's about that big, oh, yeah. but at the end, uh, Dave's scar, uh, you know, you can't see this on the podcast. I just said that big. Uh, it was about eight inches initially, but by the end, I think that scar was mm -hmm. 14. 24 inches oh, long. Wow, yeah. I don't know. I might be exaggerating on 24, but <laughs> 18 inches long. Like his scar is gigantic. And each time they put metal in, they have to go to a longer, bigger piece yeah. to fit in the bone. So, wow. so here, here's the deal. Doing that in recovery... The first couple of times it was, okay, I'm not going to leave the hospital with any pain meds. And, and uh, yeah, you know, by the time there's, there's a lot of trauma to that point. And so the pain was getting pretty, pretty bad. And, uh, you know, what do you do if you're in recovery and, and you've got painful situations like that? Yeah. Um, you know, luckily I have my support group. You know, one of my best friends, an addictionologist, um, I, I have, I work at a treatment center. And so my circle of friends and my family all understand addiction. And, you know, I take out the decisions that I have to make and let them make them, mm. let them help me through them. Um, but, but I'll tell you, the worst part of this was when I'd have to take the meds for the pain, my head would tell me, oh, you screwed up. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It was, and it was very painful and it was a lot of misery thinking, man, this is, you know, I'm not going to make it. This is horrible. Um, the, the shame, the guilt, the, the, you know, it, it was just, it was really, really bad. I could imagine. I could imagine. I mean, first of all, there's, a, and Dr. Sellers has said this, there's a difference between taking them as prescribed and abusing them. Yeah. Right. But I could imagine if, if, you're in that situation, you're owning a recovery center, you know, you, your inner circles, your family, you're all supportive of your recovery. In the meantime, you're taking something, a narcotic that, you know, mm -hmm. maybe used to be a DOC of yours. Like that would be extremely hard. Yeah. 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 I think the critical thing that Dave mentioned was support, support, support. Yes. Yeah. Like turn some of that stuff over to somebody else. And then um, it's tough. I think what Dave just described, the guilt, is is very interesting because 
Yeah, we're conditioned not to use opiates as, as we get into recovery. It does not mean that people in recovery have to suffer through eight painful surgeries, though. But it's hard to get rid of that guilt. Right. right. So did you do anything, uh, Dave? I just have to ask because I'm, I'm thinking if, if tomorrow I had to have open knee surgery, how would I, and I'm a listener, how would I go about that? Like what? Um, checkpoints did you put in place? Good, maybe good topic. To, good question. Yeah. First of all, go to, to a doctor that you can be very open and honest with and let them know your condition. Scary, right? So scary. Not, so no, not Dr. listen, Sellers. I'm serious. No, scary. This is scary <laughs> exactly. because everyone's afraid if they tell a doctor that they have a problem with pain pills, yeah. they're afraid the doctor's not going to give them pain pills, right? What, what really happens in, in, in the case of opiate dependence and um, trying to be careful with my language. I, I'm, I'm okay calling myself an addict. We don't, we try not to do that in our industry, in our field, but I'm gonna just refer to myself. In addiction, we, you know, we try to be, um, man, I lost my train of thought. Where was I going? Oh yeah, so we're telling a doctor, sorry, we're telling a doctor that we have a problem with addiction. That's supposed to trigger in that doctor a response of, First of all, this guy might actually require more pain meds than somebody who's never been addicted. Hmm. And the doctor's response is going to be less pain meds. We're afraid of telling them that because of the reaction we might get. First, the judgment. And then second of all, maybe the guy's not going to treat me adequately because he's just afraid of giving right. me pain pills. Yeah. Like, that's got to be a little scary. Did you experience that, Dave? Uh, you know, I, I was... Uh, I had a group of doctors that kind of understood the the guy that did the surgery. I, I mean, he, he's done work on me for 20 years. So, um, that's, uh, uh, that I, I knew that the pain pills would be plentiful if I wanted them. Yeah. And, and so it was just being able to talk openly how I was feeling. And, um, you know, again, I, I, I've got an addictionologist that I can talk to and, and my friends and talk about how I'm feeling and talk about the guilt and shame and the, all that stuff that's going on. So, um, yeah, Great. you know, we got through it. I, it was, uh, it was interesting, but it, we got through it. Great answer. I was, I was wondering, so I've had to have dental work done right and so i've been prescribed like lower tabs or percocets or whatever but what i try to do is i i'll give them to somebody i trust yep yep did was there any of that oh absolutely my uh my wife kind of knew what was going on and where it was at and and uh um you know you you work out with the doctor you kind of have a plan you know i don't want a big bottle of pills i want I want to be able to check in regularly to make sure that everything's good. I, I don't want to go in there and say the dog ate them. And <laughs> so, so, you know, again, you just, you set up a series of checks and balances to make sure that you're, you're on top of things, but, but there again, your head goes crazy and, and that's where you, you just need to be able to talk to people and, and figure it out. Yeah. So beautiful, beautiful. We've touched on some really good stuff here. Yeah. Um, we're down to about our last, you know, seven minutes or so, and we haven't spent quite as much time on Dave's story that uh, as I would like. But I really love the topics we've talked about. I'll shut up now. Um, <laughs> not likely. Let's get back to Dave's story, though. So what, tell us about what made you decide owning a treatment center was an idea in your life. Well, uh, like I mentioned, I finally got treatment and, and surrendered to it and had such a life changing experience. I decided this is what I want to do for a living. If I can experience this, this change and this happiness from wanting to die several months ago to, to wanting to live more than I've ever wanted to live, I want to share that. So I went back to school at a late age. I, I, uh, I started as a, I volunteered actually for a, a long time, uh, running a family group. Uh, I started off as a tech. Yeah. You know what I'm talking I about do there. Know what you're talking about. Started off as a tech working so on weekends. For the audience, a tech is somebody typically at a treatment center that, that really does the interaction with the clients, right? Right. That, right. that, that really takes care of the day-to-day -day stuff and interacts There's, with the clients. They're the ones that stay overnight. They're the ones that are there on the weekends. They're the ones that, that uh, are the frontline counselors, so to speak. They're the ones that are taking care of the problems, putting out the fires, and talking to the people that are having a rough time. They're crucial in this industry. 
So I, I, I did that for a while. I, uh, I got a, 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 a SUDC um, licensure and started doing some counseling. And, um, you know, I, I put forth the effort to really understand and really, really help the clients and, and do that. So eventually I moved into being a program director. Um, and, you know, some circumstances changed at a facility that I was at. And, and uh I had an opportunity, you know, I, I had an opportunity to, to do something. And it's funny how the planets line up and things work. That week, I had a high school friend, uh, again, one of my best buddies uh, growing up. He called and says, hey, I'm selling my RV park here in Texas and I'm moving back. I need to find some rental properties. Boy, have I got a deal for you. Ping, ping. <laughs> and so Ron Wentz is his name. He uh, he was able to to buy this house that we have, and, and we we spent several months remodeling it and, and uh, you know, kind of making it right for a, a really nice treatment center. Um, had a lot of people, you know, you, again, we talk about that support system. There's a lot of people that kind of... Um, I knew what we were about and, and what our goal was and what we wanted to accomplish and, and, and helping people. And most of, most of them in recovery themselves. And so uh, they signed on and we just had an incredible staff and was able to, to have a successful treatment center. It's Reflections Recovery up in Linden. And uh, it, it just turned out really good. Now, as a result, you know, the thing I love about this business is that, that, Wow, seventy percent of our staff were once clients. Wow, they uh, they've changed their life and they're doing things a, a lot differently. And and um, you know that's the that's the payback. That's the stuff that you really look for. Uh, unfortunately, this industry, you know, you've got insurance companies and you've got. Uh, uh, so many things going on that it, it can be a little uh, I'm going to interrupt this thought because pay attention, folks. If you're thinking about starting a <laughs> treatment center, we're about to transition for the next last couple of minutes on what are the pitfalls, Dave? What? And you don't have to go into depth, but what are what? Why would I not want to start a treatment center? Uh, well, there's a, a number of reasons. One is people die. You know, the, no. the mortality rate is that, that people go out, they get clean, and then they go out and use again and, and overdose. And so, um, you know, you, you lose a lot of people, and it, it's sad. It's, it's heartbreaking. Uh, the other thing is that you've, you've got uh, insurance companies that make it more and more difficult. Um, you know, people think, man, somebody's banking and making big money on, on uh, treatment. But what they don't realize is that insurance company may only pay a week or 10 days. And then they say it's not medically necessary anymore, so they quit paying. And many of the treatment centers will say, well, okay, then we'll, we don't want to send them out. Which so, we know in ethics is abandonment. Is a, a, a abandonment. And so we end up treating that client for, you know, 30 or 45 days. And, and, uh, and so a big portion of your treatment is actually um, scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. In the legal field, pro bono. Yeah, pro bono. So you, you told me that number last night. Your treatments for your treatment center, how much free treatment did you do? Well, there was uh, as much as uh, it was over 40% uh, was free treatment. In fact, at one point it got close to 50%. Wow. Um, but you know what? You can't keep the doors open with that. Free treatment's not even free, right? You're still no, feeding no. those people. You're still oh, right. housing those people. Cost. It's costing you money. You're, and you're paying, you're paying a staff. And, and you know what? We're not only helping the the clients, but we're helping people live and support their families. And so, you know, that's the downfall. Now, now that being said, um, it, and that can be heartbreaking and, and part of the reason why I retire, but on the flip side of that, I got to say that there is nothing more rewarding than to see a person, a family, get into recovery, change their life, get their kids back, become respectable, uh, productive members of society, and and have a life. There's nothing more fulfilling than that. I love that. That's, In the last minute. That's the payback right there. The last minute, can you take uh, us out by 
A message of hope for our listeners. Uh, you know what? I, uh, uh, a message of hope. You and I were talking about this last night is that recovery opens the doors for so many things, not only helping other people and service and feeling good, but the planets line up, doors open, and and you will find a niche, you will find a career, you will find uh, um a life. A ba- yeah, you'll find a a, 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 a calling, a calling, and an abundance. Yeah. You know, things work out, and uh, there's it, it's worked out really good for me. And and I, you know, I get to ha- hand the torch to Dustin and and watch him do the same thing. I Thanks, everybody. We're out of time. Dave Cox, Reflections Recovery. Give them a call if you're having any troubles with substance abuse. We appreciate his we appreciate our guest. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for joining us today on We Do Recover with Jared Miller. Help us spread our message of hope. Like, comment, and share. If you have any topics or ideas for future shows, please share that on our Facebook page. That Facebook page is We Do Recover with Jared Miller. If you or a loved one needs help, please reach out to us. Again, thank you for listening. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. This has been a production from... A podcast studio.